Hi, Connor. Good afternoon. Hey there. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm fine on you. I'm doing well. Okay. I don't know if you were able to see the post from Omar on the Slack. Um, oh, okay, yeah, I saw his first one. I, I didn't see his second reply. Um, yeah, so you want you think about Tuesday or Thursday? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, if we if we pick a time, I can check my work calendar. Well, it's Tuesday or Thursday going to work for you also? It depends on the spe specific time. No, for the specific time, we have to pick a new time on the Shiny app. That means we have to... John, I have to release a new shiny app. In that case, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I doubt next week because next week, me, I will not be able to meet. I will not be able to join next week. Yeah, me neither, actually. I'm going to be on vacation traveling. Yeah. Yes. So I don't know, but... Let's see who and who is going to join today because I said we are going to discuss about it. Then we come back before I can inform John that this is the situation. Whether we need to release the shiny app so that we can pick a new time slot, either Tuesday or Thursday, that will work for yeah. everybody. Not sure if Nathan is going to join, but let's just wait a bit. Mm -hmm. If it is not going to join, I think I will start. Okay.
Okay, I think I guess uh, we can start. Okay. So for the benefit of uh, those uh, that will be following along uh, on YouTube, uh, this is the data science uh, learning uh, community. And we are going through the introduction to statistical learning book. And today I will be, we'll be discussing the exercise for chapter 10, which is about uh, deep learning. And deep learning, the first question uh, uh, in this exercise, they say we should consider a neural network with two hidden layers. That is where it has four input units, that is four input predictors. It has two units in the first hidden layer and three units in the second hidden layer and a single output. So the first question, they say we should draw a picture of the network similar to the figure 10.1 and figure 10.4. Because if we look at figure 10.1, it's a single uh, layer neural network. And this single layer neural network uh, it has uh, four predictors. It has five hidden layer. It has a uh, five hidden layer, and each of these predictors they are feeding directly into the hidden layer in order for us to get the output uh, layer, which will give us uh, the, uh, the the response variable. So if you look at Figure ten point four, it has to do with the multi uh, layer uh, neural. Uh, it has to do with the multi-layer neural network. It, this is the input layer. Uh, this is the first hidden layer. This is the second hidden layer. This is the output layer, and which we are going to use in predicting uh, the response variable. So if we go back to the to the solutions in which they did here, here, we are, here is our input layer, which is there are four in number one, two, three, four, that it means the model has a four predictors. Uh, the first hidden layer has uh, uh, two, uh, it has two units. Uh, the second hidden layer, it, also, it has three units. Then this is uh, our our output layer that will be, we are gonna use uh, for to pre make the prediction for, for the response uh, variable. So the second question in which uh, they said here that we should write out an expression for f of x, assuming that the rectified linear unit activation function, activation form, they said we should be as explicit as we can. So if we look at the ReLU functions, so uh, the ReLU functions, uh, for the ReLU function, for the ReLU function is always giving us is always giving us this, okay, where g of z is equals to z plus uh, zero, where uh, if z is less than zero, then our value is uh, zero. Otherwise, otherwise what z is greater than uh, is greater than zero. So, if we go back uh, to the solutions in which they did in which they did in the book, we have a function of x, which is giving us this, where we have uh, several constants. We have our WL of three. We also have our AL of two, where A is our uh, activation function. So we also have the AL of two, which is uh, given by this equation. Then we also have the AK of one, which is giving us uh, this other equation for for every L value is equals to one, and our K2 value is equals to three, and K is equals to one, and our K1 is equals to two, and P being P, which stands for our number of predictors. Here, yeah, in this case, we are having uh, four predictors uh, in this uh, model. So, and our final ReLU model is given as this, just as I explained where if z is less than zero, our value is gonna be zero, otherwise z, otherwise z value is greater than uh, zero, which is positive. So now the, the third part question 1c, 
then I'll say we should plug in some values for the coefficient and write out the value of f of x. So we can, and we can achieve this by first of all, loading the library ISLR. Then we also load this other library. I think uh, let's do that in our studio. So we load the library. This, I also have the neural network. Okay, also the sigmoid. Okay, we set our random seeds. So here we set our sample. Okay, the sequence length. So we are looking at the number of rows in which we have in the Boston data. The Boston data is coming from the ISLR2 package. So we also check for the number of rows in the Boston, multiply this by two all over three. So, and this is gonna be our training data sets in this model. So this is the train. So we can, we can check for the head of the train. Which is per six, so we can see this is what we have. So we now fit the neural network uh, model. So where we want to make prediction for the crime. So yeah, what do I want to do? Let's see. Let's see this. Where we have add. Okay. So here yeah, we want to predict, uh, we want to see how we can make prediction uh, for the crime rates look, by using this other variable as our predictors. And here the data, we specify that we want to use the training data set in fitting our model. Then the activation function in which we are using, we are using the rectified linear units. Then we specify this hidden unit, the first should have two hidden layer. The second activation function should have three uh, hidden layer. Then I fit uh, the model. Then I now run the plots of the neural network. So we just do the plot of the neural network. And um, this gave me this final output. Here we can see that we have our LS stats, which is one of the predictors. This is another predictors. This is another predictor in which we specify in the model. Uh, this is another predictor. So this, we can say these are the inputs. Okay, so these are the inputs. So these inputs, they are feeding directly into the hidden layer. Just here in, in this model, in which I specify that we have uh, the first is going to have two uh, hidden layer. Then the next is going to have three hidden layer. So in total, I think we have about five hidden layer. So we have about five hidden layer. What is this? Okay, see here. So we can see that the predictors, they are fitting directly. So the first, we have two hidden layer, which is this and, and this other one. And the next, we have three hidden layer, which is gonna be this, this, and this. And this is this is our uh this is our output, and our output is used now used in predicting the response, which is a crime, because in our model we said our response value is crime, which is uh what we have here. So here, the, uh, these are the error and also the number of steps in which uh, they took in that uh, model. So let me proceed. So for the for the prediction, so they say we can make prediction for a given observation using this object. Firstly, let's find the ambiguous test uh, sample. So to get the ambiguous test sample, uh, first of all, we use this for the training data set. We save this in the uh, in P. Well, then we now check. Uh, we now run this uh, uh, on the test sets. Okay, so we we got all the predictors, and then we now predict on the net 
on the value of x. So I think I still have that here. Let's run that here. Okay. So we run the predictions on the on the on the test data sets. So we save it in P. This is the P. Okay. So we run this. And we save it as x. So here we have extract uh we create a vector for all the predictors. Okay, then we now run the prediction on the test uh data set. So here we are having four four one one nine point one four three nine uh two as our as our outputs. Okay, so by they now say that by repeating by hand, so we have this, okay? So here we are specifying yours using, uh, they are using the if else statement where X is greater than zero. So if X is greater than, they said if X is greater than zero, so we should retain all the value as X. Otherwise, if X is less than zero, we should re report zero there. That is for the, the ReLU the ReLU activation uh, uh, function. So for the weights, so the estimated weight for each layer, so we use this to extract uh, the weight. Then we now say as dot numeric, uh, convert everything to our input predictors. We ensure that they are all uh, numeric uh, variable. So for here, we, we are just using as a, a for loop. Then we now extract the value here on V. So we now have, 19.14392. So the noun said, how many parameters uh, do we have uh, in this model? So in order for us to get that, we are using the length. We need to unlist because we are having a list. So we need to unlist the value from the net dollar sign weight. So to get all the values, so we can see that we have, in total, we have uh, 23. Uh, parameters in the model. So they are four times two plus two plus two times uh, three plus three plus three times one plus one. So in total, we have uh, 23 uh, parameters uh, uh, being present, uh, present in this uh, model. So the second question in which uh, they ask uh, in the book, they said that we should consider the soft max functions in 10.13, see also 4.13 on page 141 for modeling multinomial probabilities. So here they said A in 10.13 show that, we should show that if we add a constant C to each of the Z one, then the probability is unchanged. So here they say, if we add a constant C to each of ZL in equation 10.13, we get we get this, we have a probability of y where m is uh, placed within x, so which is given, which is given uh, by the equation uh, that is specified uh, in, my, in my rights. So the answer, which is just equation 10.13, uh, that is what we can find in the book already. So, and in B, they said, in 4.13, that we should show that if we add a constant, which is C of J, where J is zero, one to, to a value of P, which is stands for the predictor. So to each of the corresponding coefficient for each of the classes, then the predictions at any new point X are unchanged. So for 4.13 is, we add this, so we arrive at this. So they say the predictor is on J, we arrive at this. So adding constant C of J to each class gives off, still give us uh, this. So the nouns say that which, when we, which collapse 4.13 with the same argument as above. So now in the final result, they said this shows that the softmax function is over parameterized. However, regularization and SGD typically constrain the solution so that this is not uh, a problem. So 
the third question they were talking about uh, that we should show that the negative uh, multinomial log likelihood is equivalent to the negative log of the likelihood expression when there are m is equals to what two classes. So here we are trying to see how we can apply log to this problem. So we have equation 10.14, which is uh, given by this, where we have y, y m i of log of f of m of x i, where i is equals to one and m is equals to zero. So from equation 4.5, which is given as which is given as this. So when we so when we apply log of L, so what do we have? We just simply have to have a log to this equation. So we have this P of XI. So applying log to this equation, okay? Applying log to this term, give us uh, this term. So we just add log of P into XI plus log of it into one minus p into x i all prime, where i is equals to y i is equals to one and y i prime is equals to zero. So if we set y i to be an indicator variable such that y i of one, y i of one and y of zero are one and zero, so when our height observation is one, respectively, then we can write we can write the equation as this, okay? Where where y i of one is log of p into x i plus y i of zero is log of into one minus p into x i all prime. So if we also let F1 of X is equals to this, where we have F0 of X is equals to one minus P into X, then, then we can have, then we can have log into this, which will not give us the final, this final equation. So here they say when we take the log, the negative log of this, it is equivalent to 10.14 for two classes where the first class is uh, zero and the second class is uh, is one. So the fourth question was talking about CNN convolutional neural network that takes in the 32 by 32 grayscale image and has a single convolution layer with three five by five convolution filter without bound drip pattern. They say we should draw a sketch of the input and first hidden layer similar to figure 10.8. So in figure 10.8, I think they did some in an example. Let me go back to the book. In figure 10.8, there was an example in which they did. In figure 10.8. Where is it? Ten point eight. Let's talk about convolution. Yep. So in this is an example where they, by they have an image, okay? And each of this image, uh, we have a tiny, small, tiny pixels. That is, we have thirty-two by thirty-two. So imagine this. We have this is one one convolution because this one convolution it has how many one two three images then we pull it here we have another convolution okay we pull the image here we have another convolution we pull the image here then we now flatten everything so uh they were trying to do the same example here so once we draw the image this is the image which is 32 by 32. And we know that each of these image, it has a smaller gray uh, scale that is the pixels. So when we match, add all this image, so because we have 32 by 32 by into five place. So we have one, two, three, 
four and five. So these are all the image. So this is what they refer to have. They refer to this as a, a convolution because it is made up of several image that they match uh, together to give us uh, the, the convolution. So here they were asking that how many parameters are in this, uh, in this model? So there are five convolution matrices from what we can see in this image. We have one, two, three, four, five. We have five convolution matrices, each with a five by five width, plus a five by eight stem to estimate thereafter 130 parameters. So if we have five by five, give us 25, 25 times five, give us 125 plus five by eight stem, which is going to result to the 100 and uh, 30 parameters in which we have uh, in which we have in total. So they now say in the C parts, one C, they say we should two C R, we should explain how this model can be thought of as an ordinary feed forward neural network with the individual pixels as inputs and with constraints on the weights in the hidden units, what are the constraints? So they are they are asking what are the constraints. So here we can we can see that we can think of the convolution layer as a regularized, fully connected layer. The regularization in this case is due to not all inputs being connected to all outputs and weights being shared between. Uh, the, the connection. So we can see that each output node in the convolved image can be thought of as taking input from a limited number of input pixels with a set of weights specified by the convolution layer, which are then shared by the connection to all other output nodes. So if there are no constraints, then how many weights will there be in the ordinary feedforward neural network. So if there are no weights, so how many weights we are going to have are about 5,242,885 weights to estimate. So so that is that is the total number of weights in which uh, we are going to estimate if there are no ordinary feedforward neural network in the model. So question five, they say in table 10.2 on page 433, we see that the ordering of the three methods with respect to the mean absolute error is different from the ordering with respect to test uh, R square. How can this be? So we can see that uh, the mean absolute error considers absolute differences between predictions and observed values. So it's checking for the absolute differences between predictions and observed values, whereas the R square, which is the coefficient of determination, it considers the, the normalized sum of squared differences, thus larger errors contribute relatively to R square, relatively more to R square. So larger errors will make more contribution to the R squared and mean absolute error. Okay. So now in 10.2, we'll be looking at uh, the applied questions, which starts from question six. They say that we should consider a simple function, which is given at R into beta, which is equals to sine beta plus beta all over 10, that we should draw a graph of this function over the range of beta where the range of beta goes from between minus six uh, to positive six. So here we say R, which is a function of X, where we have sine X plus X over 10. Then for X, the X values, we have a sequence of numbers that goes from minus six to plus six. Then the interval is 0 0.1. So when we run the plots, so once we run the plots, we can see that we have a range for x minus six to plus six. So these are the values. So this is uh, this is 
the graph in which they said we should draw where we specify our beta value should go from uh, minus six uh, to plus uh, six. So they now say that uh, what is the derivative of these functions, okay? What is the derivative of this function, which is cos x plus uh, one all over 10? And see, they say given that beta zero is equals to 2.3, we should run a gradient descent to find the find a local minimum for of r into beta using a learning rate of p is equals to 0 0.1 that we should show that each of beta 0 and beta 1 in your plot as well as uh, the final answer. So we can see that the derivative of our function that is cos of x plus 1 all over 10 give us the gradient for a given x. For gradient descent, we move x a little in the opposite direction for some learning rate where p is 0 0.1. So here we have x to the power of m plus 1 is equals to x to the power of what m minus p into cos of x to the power of m plus 1 all over, all over 10. So here we specify uh, the eta, which is a function that is the iteration of x where we call the row, then we say x, where we have row times cos x plus one all over 10. Then we also specify another function there where we have, we are specifying the starting value, the value for b, they call the v. Then when we look at the length, so we are having 4.612221. So when we uh, run the plot, we also add the points and for the color of the points, we say it should be red and the point character should be equals to 19. So we got this visualization. Here we still have the value of our beta, which goes from minus six uh, to plus six. This is uh, our y axis. So these are the values which were given in red. So we, they say we should repeat with beta zero is equals to uh, 1.4. So here yeah, we added 1.4 for the value of our beta zero result of the length, which is uh, giving us this. So we now run our plot. So when we have our beta zero, when it is equals to 1.4, so the value changes from this part uh, is now uh, this way. So we now fit a neural network to the default data using a single hidden layer with 10 units, okay? And the dropout regularization, have a look. They say we should have a look as a lapse, okay? So here we are using Keras, okay? So, but here, uh, I think in some of the, in some of the code, I, I have problem with uh, TensorFlow because uh, I think the version of those packets, I have problem uh, running some of those code I saw here locally on my own system, I had some issues. So here we are using Keras. So this is the data set. So we scale everything down. We specify the number of rows, okay? So we trunk it. So we say N all over three. So this is the number of test sets. This is a test ID. So this is a crime rate, which is the response variable, okay? So here we are fitting the logistic uh, regression model. So where we have our crime rate explained by everything data is a test ID. So we, are, we run our predictions, okay? So we have with that test ID, we have mean of absolute L pred of the crime, okay? Which is give us uh, 2.991999, that is for uh, for the for the logistic regression. So when we run this with Keras, so once we run this with Keras, okay, once we run this with Keras, where we are using Keras model uh, sequential, okay, the unit is 10. Activation is, we are using rectified linear units. Input shapes is number of call of X. Layer dropouts rate is 0 0.4. 
and then layer dense unit is one. So we compile everything. Loss, we are using the mean square uh, error. Then we are using optimizer RMS props. So we specify the metrics. So when we now, uh, when we now run the plots for the history, then the smooth is false. So now we are now using, uh, we are now going to have this value where the X axis we specify the epochs, then the Y axis we have both the loss and the mean absolute error for both the, the training and also the validation data sets, which we use in evaluating uh, uh, the performance uh, of a neural network uh, model in which we fitted. So when we look at the number of predicted values, so we can see uh, from here that we have six all over six minus zero S minus 53 MS epoch minus nine MS steps. So, so when we look at the mean value, so we now have 2.24 0634. In this case, the neural network outperformed the logistic uh, regressions because having a lower absolute error rate on the test data. So we can see that the neural network did a better job because here we are having 2.99. So here we are now having 2.24064. Uh, 2 so we can see that this one, it did, did that the neural network did a better job uh, than our initial uh, logistic uh, regression in which I ran earlier on. So question eight, they said from your our correction of our personal photograph, I tried to replicate uh, this, but I have problem in installing some of the packages. Example, uh, the TensorFlow, I have problem running it. I, I wanted to try my hands on this, but I could not. So, so they said, if, if the subject does not occupy a reasonable part of the image, then we have to do some, we need to crop it. So the, these, are, these are the list of 10 images in which they have. So here they are using library keras. So they have to say list.files. So images of all the animals. So they need to list it. So they are saving it in image. Then we run the array of those image, then, we, we use a for loop in fitting the model. So here, yeah, image to array, image to arrays that is coming from the TensorFlow library, okay? So here yeah, we are fitting, uh, we are fitting uh, the model and this is gonna download all those image from the TensorFlow. Uh, it's gonna download all those image, it's going to then fit the model then we are going to have them this the model, and then we are running our predictions, and then image net decode prediction top five for the top five images. Okay, then we now print at uh, the predicted, so we can see that the first is bed, the class name, description, class description, and also the score. So the class name, so these are all the class name for the bed. Okay. So the, these are the class description, okay? These are the scores, okay? These are the scores, these are the scores. So the second image is bed two, the third image is bed three, the, the next is bug, we also have butterfly, we also have uh, butterfly two, we also have Elba, we also have Hamish JPEG, and we also have tortoise uh, JPEG. So I don't know if we are able to run this locally. Hello, Connor. Yeah, what's the question? Yeah, I don't know. Were you able to re run this locally to set up uh, the TensorFlow? Because I know it has it requires uh, the Python module. No, Are unfortunately, you... I, I didn't have time this week to run it. Um, but yeah, that's something that's a challenge for me too. I don't, I don't, I don't have a good Python installation on my on my laptop. 
Okay. Well, I've asked how were you so that I can fix mine up because I tried several times. Even the previous cohorts, I think they were complaining that they were unable to set it up in their machine. Mm. Yeah, I've heard so, it's challenging, so. Yes. So question nine, so they said we should fit a lag five autoregressive model for the NYSE data as described in the text lab and refit the model with the a 12 level factor representing the month does this factor improve the performance of the model so fitting the model as described in the text so we have library tidyverse so we said we run, run our isrl2 library then then the data matrix okay we specify all the our uh, terms so DJ return log volume and log vola volatility, then is trend. So we are one so NYC. So we need these are the training data set we will use to train our model. X data we scale all the X data down where we have mean of zero, uh, standard deviation of one. So we have lag M, which is a function of X where K is equals to one. So the number of row of X, okay? Then we have the matrix. So the we have the row bind of part, then X, where we have one to N minus K. Then here we have the air frame. We have beta dot frame. So we specify the log of the, the log of the volume. So L1, which is the log of M where X data is one then L5, which is gonna be this. So AR frame, which is gonna be uh, the opposite of one column, every other thing, every other uh, except uh, one to five, row one to five, every other row will be written except one to five. Is train the same? Then here we are fitting, we are fitting the model, okay? where log of volume is going to be our response. So here we run our predictions. Here is the variance. Then here is we extract the mean. Okay, we extract the mean of AR pred minus AR frame, not is not the training, but the test set. Then we have log volume raised to the power of two all over V0. So we have 0 0.41. Three two. Now we add a month and work with uh, the tidy verse. So once we add the month into this, okay, we are having zero point uh, four one seven zero four one eight. So we can see that adding month as a factor marginally improves our R square because here we are having zero point four one. Here we are having zero point four one seven. So it just raises a little bit of our model from 0 0.41322 to 0 0.4170. This is a significant improvement in fit. And model two has a lower archaic uh, information criterion. So once we look at the ANOVA for AR fit and AR fit two. So once we look at the ANOVA, okay, we have this value. Okay, we have this value and it was also significant. So that is by comparing those two models in which we fit. So when we look at the AIC of the these two models, we can see that the first model has this and the second model has this value for the AIC. So the first is 8,447.663. We have 8,433. We can see that the second model has smaller value for the AIC. Okay, so for the 10th, question 10, they said in section 10.9.6, we showed how to fit a linear autoregressive model to the NYSE data using the LM function. However, we also mentioned that we can flatten the short sequences 
produced for the uh, uh, re recurrent uh, neural network model in order to fit a linear AR model. So here we use this later approach to fit a linear AR model to the NYSE data. Compare the test, then with the answer, we should compare the test R square of this linear AR model to that of the linear AR model that we fit in the lab. Then what are the advantages and desire of this approach? So the first, they say they, they use the LM model is the same as the above. So it's the same thing as what we did above, where we have the R square to be 0 0.4170418. So now we reshape the data for the RNN model. So when we reshape the data, okay, okay, we flatten it down. We now fit the model, okay? So we, we now fit the model, we now run a plot on that model. So here we are having the epoch, okay? We are having the loss in the y-axis. We have both training and validation. So we can see that as the value, as the value of the, as the value of the epochs uh, increases, we can see that our value of the loss, uh, as, a, as a value of the loss, as the value of the loss drops for both, for in the, when we started, we can see that here we have, the loss was around, uh, it was around 2 point, uh, 2 point, let's say 2.4 and the, the epoch value, the epoch value was around zero point something. So as, as the value of the as of the value of the epochs goes up, we are expected to see uh, the value of the loss to come down. But that is a negative uh, relationship. So that is we can see the the training set and also the validation sets here, which we will use to assess uh, the performance of the model. So when we now run the predictions, so we now look for the mean value. So here we are now having 0 0.41363. So we can see that both model estimates estimate the same number of coefficients per weight. So here we are having 0 0.41. So here we are having 0 0.417, so we can see that both, uh, both the LM model and also this other model, they give us uh, uh, the same uh, value. So if you look at the coefficient of AR fits of our model, so we, we can see that these are all uh, the coefficients from that uh, model. So model and then get the weights. So these are, these are all the weights in which we can we can get uh, from the model. So we can see that they flatten uh, RNN as a lower R square on the test data than our LM model above. The LM model is quicker to fit and conceptually simpler, also giving us the ability to inspect the coefficient for the different variables. So they flatten uh, uh, RNN is regularized to some extent as data are pro processed in batches. So question 11 talk about that we should repeat the previous exercise, but now fit a nonlinear AR model by flattening the short sequences produced for the RNN model. So from the book, to fit a nonlinear AR model, we could add a hidden layer. We can we could add a hidden layer. So here we have input shape, which is five and three. So we activation, we are using the ReLU, the unit we are using 32. Layer dropout rate is this. So we can add some hidden layer. So once we run this, this is uh, specifying the history. We are fitting the model here. 
Yeah, what are we doing? We are trying, we are plotting the values, the metrics we are using, we are using the mean square uh, error. So we run the predictions. So we look for the one minus the mean. So we can see that here, our R square value is 0 0.4291268. So this approach improve our R square over the linear uh, model as we can see above. So, so for the question 12 talks about that we should consider the RNN fits to the so the NYSE data in section uh, 10.9.6, then we should modify the code to allow inclusion of the variable that is day of week and fit the, the RNN, then we compute the test R square. So to accomplish this, I will include day of the week as one of the lag variables in the RNN. Thus, our inputs for each observation will be that is a four by five rather than three by five. So, so we, we get all the predictors, okay? So here uh, we are fitting, we are now fitting, uh, specifying the Keras model sequential. So here we are model, then we are doing our compile. The loss is mean square error. So this, uh, this is the model, then we now fit the actual model here. Then we now run the predictions. So we now see that here we are having an R square value of 0 0.4409, which is uh, quite higher, which is quite higher than what we have here for the our previous uh, model. Okay, so for the last part of the for the last part, they say we should repeat the analysis of lab 10.9.5 on the IMDB data using a similarly structured neural network. There, we use a dictionary of size 10,000. Then we consider the effects of varying the dictionary size, try the, then we try the values for, we, we try the values for 1,000, 3,000, 5,000, and 10,000, and compare, uh, and then we now compare the results. So these are the futures, okay? We are comparing these uh, four different uh, futures, so then uh, we will fit uh, the model, okay? Maximum futures, these are the futures, then they specify the accuracy, then we we cable so, so that it's gonna be in form of uh, the table, so we can see that when we have 1,000, the accuracy is 0 .0 0 0.86704. When we had the max futures of 3,000, this is the accuracy. When we have 5,000, this is the accuracy we can get from the model. When we have 10,000, this is, we had 0 0.86454. So we can see that, that varying the dictionary size does not make a substantial impact on our estimates of accuracy. However, the models do take a substantial amount of time to fit, and it is not clear we are finding the best fitting models in each case. For example, the model using a dictionary size of 10,000 obtain an accuracy of, of 0 0.8721 in the text, which is different from the estimate of 10 years as uh, differences between the models with different uh, dictionary uh, size. So uh, that is all uh, I could uh, cover in the exercise. I don't know if uh, there are comments uh, or questions uh, before we wrap it up for today. I think the main thing I learned from, from this chapter is that it seems like the neural net, I, th I think the, um, the hidden layers act as their own feature extraction or, or feature creation mechanisms. 
whereas in, in the other models that we've used in the other chapters, you've got to do it yourself. Yes, yes, yes. Because this one is just bringing the hidden layers uh, into the model and each of our inputs, which is our predictors, they need to, they, they need to have a kind of like a connection to the hidden layer because we can see the X1 is, uh, is feeding directly to A1, this X2 is feeding directly to this. So you need to feed values to this uh, hidden layer. And from this hidden layer, we are going to extract a function where we are going to use, which is our output uh, function, where we are going to have in making prediction for our va y variable, which is uh, the response. So that is just uh, the difference. The neural network is just bringing the, the hidden layer in, while in our normal model, yep. there is nothing like uh, the hidden layer. <laughs> 